So in today's world, everyone wants to go digital. But the important question to introspect is, do we have what it takes? From an individual standpoint, we need uh, talented resources such as digitally literate project managers, experienced BAs. From an organizational perspective, we need a culture and infrastructure to actually bring about these digital changes. To talk more about the interdependence of these capabilities in delivering excellence in digital, we have a panel discussion now. So let me introduce you to our esteemed panel. Mr. Praveen Kanamuri, Director, Advantage ERP Products, CGI. Mr. Venugopal Ji, GM and Head, Enterprise Digital Advisory, Robert Bosch. And Mr. Ashish Mehta, MD, India and APEC IIBA, who will help us in moderating the discussion. Please welcome them with a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. So um, you would have noticed some change from the agenda. I think there were a few more speakers uh, for various reasons, business reasons and personals. Um, they had to miss out. Um, what we decided is to run it very differently. Uh, we don't want to run it like a usual panel discussion. And we want to role play. We want to play the personas and that we are actually living today. So Praveen um, uh, runs a lot of enterprise solutions for CGI. He has a lot of expertise in the, uh, the operations, the back office, where there is a lot of influence of digital that's coming in. So Praveen will take that persona. Um, Venu, as he puts it, He'll represent the confused digital world. I really like this term. So he's going, to, he's going to do that. And I will continue to represent the community. I'll continue to represent um, IIBA standpoint. Uh, I continue to represent how we see the shift in the business analysis space. And uh, we'll focus on the interdependencies of critical capabilities for driving success in the digital world. Uh, and in, what, in that, what we want to do is, while we are building the conversation, Let's be interactive. We don't have to wait till the end of the no. you know, panel discussion, so-called panel discussion, for you to ask the question. So what we think, uh, that let it, be, let, let it be interactive. We can put our point of view, but let's have conversation across the board. Are you with us? Are you with us? Yes. Very nice. Thank you. So uh, let me introduce the topic. I think we did discuss this topic um, in the morning sessions. A uh, little, little, you know, uh, to some extent, where we we're talking about disruption, innovation, transformation. But what does that mean to us as a community? And there were a lot of questions around how much technology should we know? Um, how much, uh, you know, is business analysis dead? You heard that, right? Uh, what kind of roles BAs are going to play? Um, in the digital context, how are these capabilities interrelated? Right? What does it mean? To, uh, to all of you in terms of how you want to shape up your careers. You know, how do you want to shift? Is it about just pure foundational business analysis? Do you want to do some specialized stuff, learn some technology, uh, or have some technology appreciation? To what extent, and being agile, and so on and so forth, right? So to what extent those interdependencies exist? And what does it mean to you from a capability development, from a skill development standpoint? Are you with us? All right, so let's stay with this. So, Praveen, I want to go to you first, sure. okay? Um, 25 years back, when, we, when, we, when I got into the industry, the first role that I did was um, pre-selling an enterprise solution, an ERP to be specific, and implementing that ERP. And what that meant was a lot of process transformation and process automation and in that journey with SAP and you know, Barn and PeopleSoft, some of the products don't, don't exist today. They got merged, uh, and so on and so forth. And a lot of the custom ERP solutions that were built to now, where we're talking about a lot of digital uh, orientation around it. And in the last 25 years, those enterprise solutions that were implemented 25 years back has become the backbone of enterprise. And at the same time, um, they, have, they, have, they hold a ton of information, a ton of data. And organizations have built inherent dependencies on them. Right? So given that kind of environment, where do you think digital will come in? And where do, where do we get to see the interdependence of capabilities? We want to shed sure. some light from your role. Yes. An audible? Yep. 
Is it better? Looks like I need. Okay. It works when I bend down. Sorry. Okay. Um, is it better now? Let me see. Let me help. Yeah. Don't worry about it. You keep talking. Yeah, keep talking. I'll help you. To put it here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ashish, for the nice uh, introduction. So, uh, coming back to your uh, question, I'll just take a step back. Maybe may not be 25 years, years back, but 20 years back when I started my career um, in this whole enterprise world. Definitely, as Ashish mentioned, the whole crux was around, OK, these are my business processes. And primarily related to back office operations, it was more around supply chain, more around uh, you know, financial processes, invoicing, you know, payment realization, and so on and so forth. So it was more like the th whole theme or the definition of ERP was like, OK, can we have a single source of truth, single point of entry, the same information getting shared across the organization, ensuring that the decisions can be made based on whatever data is present, and so on and so forth. So that was a sort of uh, the thought process at that point of time. And incidentally, like what uh, Ashish mentioned, SAP is what, 75 and before. And the ERP that I'm working now, Advantage, was born, was, you know, was uh, built even before I was born. So these are. Uh, you know, the, these are legacy solutions which definitely met the standards of ERP. Now, having said that, my first role was as a finance consultant, finance and supply chain consultant. So going to the customer's place, trying to understand what are his processes, and you know, coming up with the standard uh, traditional process of the gap fit document saying that, oh, okay, this is your process. Can you do this process in a different manner? Uh, or can you, you know, even give up this process, so on and so forth. So all of this was definitely done at that point of time. And what started evolving in this whole ERP space, if I do some fast forward to the current space and what we are all working you know, as an industry, not just the ERP that I'm working on, user experience. This has come a long way. And again, stakeholder management within the BA. So there are lots of things which are coming in focus and what our customers want when we go for any sale or pre-sales. They say, okay, fine, all that is fine. It's taken for granted. Whatever you spoke about 20 years back is just a hygiene factor. What do we need now? I don't care whether you're in back office, front office. I want the same user experience which I get in Amazon today. I, my employee is working on the system. I want a fantastic user experience. I don't care which system it is. That's one thing. The next important thing that they ask us is, okay, how would you help us with very quick, reliable, fast, and better decisions so that I can take my business to the next level. So it is no more just recording the system, ensuring that we are compliant with the processes, and so on and so forth. So this is the second thing that we are, they are asking. And the third thing, which started happening almost a decade back, you know, it was not particularly the digital transformation, but going digital. Different ways of entering this information, integrating it with you know, barcode scanners and so on and so forth, so that I don't need to go and take stock of each and every item that I have, or the ability to perform some activities. The salesman is going, and he's trying to sell to a potential customer. He wants to know whether we have a stock of it or not, and so on and so forth. So the tablets and the mobiles came in. So this is sort of going digital. But then, with the advent of all of this technology today, and also data playing a very important role, you know, the question that we had asked, I mean, as recent as a uh, presentation that we had with one of our prospects. And incidentally, uh, CGI, uh, this ERP deals primarily with the state and local governments of US. So despite being uh, the government customers, one of the things that they asked us is, yeah, I understand that your solution can help me track all the grants that are being provided to different charitable organizations or different departments. I know you can track them, so on and so forth. Okay, that's good. That as a starting point. But can you tell me where should I spend my money wisely? Should I spend on this highway project? Should I spend on building more schools? Should I spend on improving the health condition of the society? So sky is the limit now. There is no boundaries there where they would want to ensure that we as a partner or a vendor help them take not only the information that they have within the system, but can we also take publicly available information or 
uh, information like sentiment analysis, lots of things happening on the social media. Can we see, uh, you know, and read those comments or read the feedback that my customers are providing? Not, I mean, primarily the citizens, because the state and local, the primary goal is about the service. Are they happy about my service? Are they not happy about my service? So they need to understand all of these factors, and that should go back into the system, and my ERP should be able to tell us whether I should invest in this, in you know, development of a particular park or something for the next year. How do I do my budgeting? So that's that's the level at which even the government organizations are working. And trust me, I mean, uh, the spend on their front office is far high, and the same is now percolating onto the back office operations, and the line is getting diminished between the front office and the back office. It's blurring. Yeah. Sorry. Very nice. Great. Thank you, Praveen. I think I love the context of how this enterprise back office journey has converted from a pure back office operations to a more front end focus where you want to talk about more problem solving. And I'm, I'm sure when you talk about digital in that context, the, the kind of abilities that are needed from business analysis, you raised one user experience, but I'm sure there's automation, there yep. is robotics, and there is IoT, and all those and, you know all those technologies getting implemented. <laughs> where back office is getting integ integrated with some of these technologies, so there's a lot of layers getting built on it. Am I correct? Yeah, especially supply chain, for example, supply chain. Uh, AI, ML, all of these are coming into place now. Uh, I, I, I'll just take one example, Ashish. Twenty years back, we built a solution where uh, for a manufacturing industry who had almost forty branches across uh, India, and they had two manufacturing locations. So they wanted to understand which, uh, which of the materials should come from which particular uh, production center, and you know they had different conditions and uh, so on. So we had this concept of business rules. But now that whole world has changed. They, we don't write business rules and we don't go into that uh, you know, amount of coding. We are employing AI to understand how can we improve the whole supply chain logistics process. And different ERP solutions have gone uh, way beyond. Okay, let me shift uh, to you, Venu, in your confused digital world. <laughs> Good one. Um, I think it is, uh, it is uh, nice. And if you notice, uh, you know, our launch video that we played in the morning, it showed that context. Digital is very contextual in nature. It means different things to different people. It, you know, digital, if you ask to a retail guy, uh, would be probably most user experience, uh, more mobile apps. To a digital, to a healthcare person, probably it, it's something different, and so on and so forth. Right? So it's very contextual in nature. So I want to ask you, Venu, from your confused digital world, what are your experiences of the interrelated capabilities and how things have changed? Yeah, Ashish, thank you. And uh, the first point that you talked about is very relevant. Uh, there is a different connotations or interpretations to digital itself, depending on whom we are talking to. Coming to the point. Uh, yeah, interdependencies, maybe I'll just, I'll just take a step back and explain that slightly differently. Uh, uh, I'm coming from the digital world, and I, I lead the enterprise digital advisor at uh, Robert Bosch. And uh, digital in our world is definitely it's all about user experience. It's also about uh, industry 4.0 initiatives, IoT-led initiatives in the enterprises, and so on. And of course, data artificial intelligence, et cetera, uh, are the foundational layers. Without that, digital cannot even be, even be envisaged. So if you look at all the components broadly put up that I just mentioned, you know, you cannot play a so-called consulting role or a business analyst role without appreciating everything. So unlike in an enterprise context where uh, we have seen the world running for the last couple of decades at least, in, in a level of maturity, the kind of discipline and the stability uh, it has from a BA community perspective, we do not have that discipline or stability when it comes to the core digital world, which is why I said, I use the term that it's, it's, a, it's a world of com confusion. And why this conf confusion is for two, three reasons. One, if I take a digital solution, if you are running an SAP program, you can create a five-year roadmap. You can create a three-year roadmap and implement a package. You can roll out a package. In the world of digital, it's difficult to envisage three months down the line, at times even two weeks down the line, because uh, the solution tenet needs to be invented and reinvented as we go. What it means is that day one onwards, you are wearing a hat 
of a, of a thinker, you are wearing a hat of a solutioning, etc., or the, the person who is driving solutioning, etc., and then you have to be extremely creative. So in the digital world, if a BA needs to succeed, Ashish, I would say that all the other things that we, what I have been hearing since morning, I mean, now where I heard this point of uh, the creative energy, I think uh, a, a person needs to be very, very creative. Now, will it come from uh, birth and the DNA, or can that be cultivated? We are of the strong opinion that creativity can be cultivated through experience and, and certain exposures, etc. So the creative energy that a BA needs to carry through, along with that, the ability to, ability to connect the dots. Let me uh, maybe talk about one example just to drive the point. Uh, a few months ago, we carried out a program in Latin America in counting blueberries. The issue was the, 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 the agriculture, the, the, the farmer, is not able to predict what is his yield. It was an agriculture problem. A month ago, I happened to interact with one of the largest chemical conglomerates in India. Now, it was a BA who connected the dots from Latin America, blueberry to an inventory system, SAP carrying a system stock, where I have a heap of chemical lying there. And I, ha I always have a problem of uh, system stock not matching with uh, the, the actual stock. Classical. classical inventory problem, classical manufacturing problem, classical supply chain problem. Borrowing an idea from agriculture, superimposing on inventory management and creating a wow factor. This company has been, I can't name the company for confidentiality reasons, has been writing off crores of uh, money when it comes to a quadrant or a annual, uh, uh, as part of the annual reporting process. Now, the horizontality of the technology, be it video analytics or image analytics, and stitching the image to, 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 uh, to come out with certain capabilities. So the horizontality of this, this uh, technology, the connecting the dots between two functional realms, I think that's an immense, that's of immense potential and uh, leverage for a for a BA. To me, that is the dominant character of a uh, an evolving BA in the digital world. So I'm glad both of you have raised beautiful um, industry problems and scenarios that sets the context of what BAs need to do. But let's. And I'll, I'll, I'll represent from an IIBA standpoint what we are trying to do, right? I mean, we're living the same world, and our job is to provide standardization to this role, guide the community, as you know, guide with the best practices, uh, communicate what roles, responsibilities, business analysis professionals, irrespective of the title that they carry, uh, should carry, and you know, so on and so forth. Um, and we've done a lot of research in digital as well, right? I mean, looking at uh, digital from three angles. The first angle is a um, lot of the legacy environment, where digital is being put as a veneer. That's the first angle. The second angle is um, experiences like Uber and Amazon of the world, where nobody predicted or nobody had those expectations earlier. It just, it just was made to happen by a few people who thought about that experience, and then technology enabled that experience, right? So there is a, a top-down view, there is a bottom-up view. And then third is the intersection of the capabilities, right? Um, you've been hearing since morning, uh, the tradition business analysis, somebody says it's dead, somebody says it should be business technology analysts, somebody says uh, you know, it would be transformation managers, you heard these terms. Um, but from an IIBA standpoint, it's the maturity of the profession that is occurring right now. And I want to set that as an example, right? 50 years back, I'm sure, in the medical profession, Everybody was baseline doctor. Nobody had the knowledge of specialized capabilities or practices that could be cured, right? Nobody was oncologist. Nobody was, um, you know, ophthalmologist. Nobody was pediatrician, and so on and so forth. I think the, when this profession evolved, a ages back, everybody had common practices. Of course, there were discoveries being made in specific areas, but then the foundational knowledge of how the body behaved remained pretty common. Right. And as the profession matured, as the research matured, as, as the demand occurred, the specializations appeared. And not just that, I think we are living in a world in medical profession 
where we're getting to micro specialization, right? If a, a uh, two-year-old kid breaks his or her arm, it's not, you don't go to um, uh, ortho anymore. You go to a pediatric ortho, which is specialized just for that, you know, that world, right? So it has become that specialized. So if we take that analogy back in how we are looking at, as IIB, how we are looking at this profession, I think it's getting into that maturity curve where the foundation is well laid out, right? The foundation in terms of the best practices, in terms of the capabilities, in terms of the knowledge of soft skills and hard skills that are needed for every BA, irrespective of every business analysis profession, let me call it differently. I don't want to use title as business analyst, right? You maybe have different titles in this room, but eventually when you are using business analysis practices, those are common foundation that got laid out, laid out and the expectation is you need to have that, irrespective of whether you're operating in the enterprise world or the digital world or any other world for that matter. You are on a process-centered engagement or a digital-centered engagement or a legacy engagement or a product development environment or anything of that sort, right? Now, as we get into the digital world where, uh, you know, when you said, you know, two, two weeks down the line, we have to deliver a value. And in that, there are new technologies that are coming in, there are new practices that are coming in, from an IIB standpoint, we're looking at how this practice is getting matured into verticals, into specializations. One of the revelation we went through last year, and if you notice some of the researches that we did uh, through IIBA thought leadership papers, uh, you, know, you can see them on IIBA's website. And if you read them, um, one revelation that we discovered by talking to so many people is that it is not one BA anymore which will provide the end-to-end -end business problem or solve the end-to-end -end business problem or provide end-to-end -end value to the customer because a human can learn only so much. In digital context, when we look at large transformation, it's about a lot of technologies coming into application and a lot of um, newer areas or functions coming together at the same time. So there are various domains coming to together. We call them domain convergences. We've got a lot of technologies that are coming together and it is humanly impossible for a human like me, for that matter, to know blockchain and AI and machine learning and cognitive and AR and VR. And I can keep walking. I can tell you that. I can't understand all of this. So what does that mean to me from a specialization standpoint is that if I, if I have my bent, for example, on data, and if I focus on analytics and data science and build my vertical specialization in that area, keeping my foundational business analysis principles intact and work with the team where some other BA has a specialization in AI, ML, he understands that, and some other BA understands blockchain, and some other BA understands cloud, and so on and so forth. That's the perspective IIB is carrying now. And um, if you noticed, um, some of the IPs that we are releasing, some of the certifications that we are releasing is all in going in that direction. Right? You heard agile analysis coming out, the focus on agility as a concept. It's no more a software development methodology. So if you look at uh, IIB's value proposition in the agile world, it says, how can you be agile at the strategy level? How can you be agile at the uh, initiative level when you break that strategy into five initiatives? And further down to the program level, and how do you apply various business analysis practices across the board in an agile fashion? Right? Um, CBDA, the data analytics certification that came out, and there is another one coming on a product ownership, especially with the context of how business analysis professionals you know, operate. That's the view we are taking from a rescaling, from an interdependence of capability standpoint, and things like that. Yeah, that's it. Does that, does that sound okay? Does that yeah. sound okay to help guide some of the confusion that you have in the digital world? <laughs> yeah, so that's a good point. In fact, that's a question that you asked. Maybe I did not explicitly answer the question. So I started off with saying that uh, a, a surviving BA needs to stitch the dots, Correct. connect the dots very, very well. And as you mentioned, uh, a BA has to be immensely dependent on multiple pockets of uh, expertise. So again, the point of interdependency. For example, I may not be a data scientist. I need to have a basic appreciation of what data can do in my context. And beyond a limit, somebody said, can I demarcate till I do coding, till I, I can do uh, my BA work? Something of that sort. I, I, I would need to exp, you know, have an, a, a high level appreciation of what data science can do in this specific context. Let me take a, maybe an example would do. 
we happened to speak to a manufacturer some time back. They said they have a big problem. I'm replacing a bearing. Each bearing costs about two to three lakhs. Every fortnight, I have to replace a bearing. Can you analyze my bearing and solve my bearing problem? No, and this bearing is situated in a very, very complex machine. It is not directly accessible. You can't keep a sensor uh, you know, getting embedded in the bearing and, and uh, uh, use a sensorized data for analysis. So we figured out, and a set of BAs worked on this, and they figured out it's easier to create a digital twin of this entire equipment and see what's happening. And we proved to the client that it's not a bearing problem. It's a foundation problem. The foundation on which the entire machine is running on. So you, 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 your, your, your problem statement it was, it itself was wrong, right? Again, we had to depend on a digital twin technologist, right? We had to depend on a mechanical engineering expert, etc. So again, the BA work was uh, successful because he could connect the dots between mechanical engineering, between data analytics, between sensorization, and, bit, and uh, a digital twin. These four things had to be stitched, and we, we took about three months to solve the problem. The client is extremely happy. Imagine three lakhs of rupees, or six lakhs per month, into 12. That's the recurring cost for one machine. This company has about, uh, about 20 odd machines in one factory. The company has about 50 to 52 factories across the globe. Look at the, the cost impact through this, this, uh, this, this intervention. So, so I loved uh, two points that you brought in. That interdependencies of capabilities is contextual. That's and right. I like that because, That's right. uh, because, and I can relate to this, you know, the problem space you're seeing. You know, we keep talking, you know, one of the title of this conversation was how many interdependent capabilities? I mean, if you look at BA Convention Horizon, we brought in six at this platform. But is there a seventh or eighth or ninth or tenth? You know, one, one way of looking at it. Out of those six, what is important to maybe person A versus person B versus person C? I think it is all contextual with the way the people are operating in different worlds. Right? Right. So it's a great point that you made. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, yeah, just to, just to add on to that, now, uh, this is where I said that, that creative energy, right? Uh, uh, in a supply chain context, you know, is it, is it a problem that a blockchain can solve, or is it a problem that mere tracking can solve, et cetera? So that is the contribution of a BA there. You know, BA needs to contextualize and figure out, probably this is a potential blockchain uh, uh, problem. Potentially, this is a track and trace problem, et cetera. Or potentially, this is a sensorization-led data acquisition, data anal analytics, algorithm-led uh, problem solution, et cetera. That is where, to me, a BA's uh, role is. And once a high-level hypothesis can be framed, then comes interdependencies on the respective so pockets of So given an opportunity, I'm definitely going to hire you as a BA. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think these are, these yeah. are phenomenal points. Praveen, you wanted to add something. Yeah, just going back to his uh, point. An audible, sorry. Going back to your original question and uh, about the interdependence, I strongly believe in this ecosystem approach for a business analyst. Whether it was two decades back or currently, it is a combination of different factors which operate on the ecosystem that we serve. So what do I mean? Like if my ERP, ERP product is serving state and local, so they are operating in an ecosystem where they have lots of citizens and they have lots of regulations. Likewise, if I'm in a manufacturing industry, I'm operating with lots of market forces, the competition forces, the regulations, the technology. And many of you would have played the role of a PO or a product manager. It's the same dilemma even for a business analyst today to understand, as he rightly said, what is the best technology that I should be using to solve a problem. And I will also take a step back saying that some of the fundamentals of the BA thought process will not go anywhere, like the use case, the relevance of the use case. And I'll, tell, I'll take a practical example of what happened with our Central Industrial Security Force, airport checking. So they wanted to improve the security year on year, day on day. We always have you know, multiple threat models, so on and so forth. So uh, they wanted to analyze the problem about when the baggage is actually ver uh, verified, scanned, they put the seal. They said, how can technology improve us? They did lots of analysis. But after a week, you know what was the solution? There was one person who stood up and said, if I have been able to cross your security barrier. It means that I have been checked thoroughly. Why do you need a stamp or another technology to validate if that bag was checked? 
So this was a classical use case where they said, okay, technology is there, we can do lots of things. Technology is, there's no boundaries to technology, but can we ensure that we are, you know, focusing on the right problem? Great. Yeah, so just to add to the, the, the one risk with uh, the classical use case approach, and I, again, I completely agree with what, uh, uh, what he said, uh, don't let the client, in case if you're, if you're dealing with a business stakeholder in your own organization or, uh, or in a client context, don't let the client define the use case. Use case needs to be defined by you after understanding the problem. Don't believe, uh, don't mistake the symptom for problem. You know, the, the bearing example I said. Had I gone ahead solving the bearing problem, I would not have never prob solved the problem. So I think use case needs to be owned by you. Yeah. Not, don't merely be, a, merely be a sophisticated stenographer taking the notes from a client in terms of a requirement gathering. I think that era is gone. We, we have to evolve from a, a, a classical uh, requirement gathering to requirement, an impactful requirement generation kind of a realm. I think that evolution needs to happen. I completely agree with this point because gone are the days, I understand the statement, you know, all of us uh, used to start off with saying, okay, what is the problem that we are trying to attack? But it, go, it has gone beyond. We are not building solutions for attacking problems. We are actually building solutions for the ecosystem, which means I want my customer to provide the best user experience or be a dominant player in his own ecosystem. I'm, so I'm building solutions for the future. And I, I'm telling this out of personal experience where this was the theme in Microsoft where we said, okay, you are building a world-class solution and we are not evaluating the features or a functions against uh, my competitors only. We, are, we would want to understand the way businesses are operating. So this is pertinent for every BA. I mean, gone are the days where I'm just confining to, as he rightly said, I get a specification document and then look into it. No, I, today it is imperative that I do some market research myself. There's lots of information, how, you know, in terms of whether it's the technology or how the businesses are operating. Again, I know it goes back to domain, uh, but that is the starting point and I'm building solutions for the domain. And again, the other interdependency of negotiation skills or stakeholder management comes in, in terms of, helping the client understand the merit behind the process that I'm suggesting. Why is it a win-win for us? I mean, we are treated as partners, right? I mean, it's not about uh, just my margin that I make with the client, that, that is gone. And especially when we are building products for a common landscape, we want to make this life a better place to live. Very nice. I think one of the amazing part of this conversation is, um, so I'm just trying to summarize it, okay? Um, and IIBA, we're trying to deal with the same problem, right? How do we, help one of the biggest challenge that, have, that our community has posted on us is careers. And we believe there is a lifelong learning uh, that a BA community needs to go through, but what is that the framework? What is that approach that BAs can follow uh, to develop their careers, right? What we just discussed here, there are three dimensions that have come out. Uh, I'm glad that those three dimensions are mapping exactly same to our MVP that we've already created. Okay, one of the dimension that came out is business context. So when we talk about interdependence of capabilities and what you could do in your individual context and how you want to shape up your career is that business context in which you are operating, right? So are you operating in healthcare or BFSI? Domain continues to play a significant role where BA, um, you know, learns that domain and adds value. Of course, the, the size and shape of the domain has changed, right? It's about a lot of digital intervention uh, that is driving innovation um, and disruption in those domains. And what that means is the second dimension of digital technologies, right? They're becoming foundation to everything that every role is doing. It's not, it's not BA alone, right? So technology, because it has become integral part um, of a day-to-day -day life for businesses, you just heard Bharat saying he's a technology company driving, happened to be in the insurance space. I think these are these terms you hear that pretty often now. And technology has become an integral part. So the second dimension is what technology bent you have. You want to do data, you want to do analytics, you want to do cloud, you want to do um, uh, AI, ML, and so on and so forth. There's no end to it. You can decide what career path you want to have. So that's the second dimension. And third dimension, which is still foundational, is the core principles of business analysis. That don't change. Do you think you can, you can facilitate a digital conversation 
in a very, very hazy, confused world of digital without having phenomenal facilitation skills that you built over so many years, as an example, right? The amount of analysis abilities that you carry in, in eliciting a business problem and constructing that problem better in the context of the business situation you are in. Do you think you can do away with that to succeed in digital? I think these things have become even more significant because the world has changed. It is more confused in terms of uh, you know, how, how uh, Venus is put together than what it used to be 10 years back where you know, we had 90% correct requirements and we used to still crib that our customer has not signed off 10% use cases. Am I correct? Those worlds have changed, right? So I think if we put these three dimensions together, yeah. we can really draw what kind of capabilities each of us should focus on and what kind of interdependencies we want to build for ourselves uh, as far as those capabilities are concerned and decide to what extent we need to go to learn. Should we learn Python to be an ML expert or stay as much as I understand about Python at the high level, I think that's enough for me. It depends on the business context and the environment you're operating in. But I just wanted to summarize, I think it's a phenomenal context because what we are doing at IIB is really working on this career architecture framework. And I'm glad these points came up. We had done a lot of research to come up with those dimensions. And without naming that, and I don't think we spoke, we didn't, right? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't yeah. spoke about yeah. it. <laughs> so, so I'm glad that these things are conver convergent. Let's have Q&A. Let's open up the conversation. I don't want to get deeper. I think the point is pretty clear. Yeah. Business analysis as a profession is going to become even more critical. It, you could have a different title. Product owner, transformation agent, transformation manager, uh, business consultant. You may say business analyst is dead. The point is it's the title that may die. But the practice is becoming even more critical. Right, and that that I think you can validate that in the in the environment you are living in. Actually, so that's well said, Ashish. In fact, in the digital world, uh, from a client perspective, or whatever the the business context that we are referring, to, even for your own organization, uh, uh, if I pick up one profile whom the client would look forward to, or the most respected role in a, in a team of 10 people, it is a business analyst. The semantics may be different. Yeah, okay. He may be positioned as a solution architect. He may be positioned as a product owner, but it's a business analyst role. So in the digital world, business analyst is much more prominent and much more dominant and stays through the, through the life cycle of the program. Correct, it's correct. It's not just requirement and then log off. Correct. In a digital world, business analyst stays through one year, two year, throughout the program. Correct, correct. Absolutely. Very well said. All right. So. Um, time up. We'll go back to you guys now. What are you guys experiencing? I see a lot of curiosity and hands. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my question is for you, Ashish. So, my name is Arun and I'm associated with ITC Infotech as a business analyst. The, Hi. Prem Hi. the premise of disruptive innovation remains pivotal to digital transformation and the rapid pace at which digital transformation is being adopted dictates for the necessity of change adoption. Now, how do you tackle or deal with the resistance and the unwillingness of people to adapt to that change? Well, to me, there are two answers to it, OK? Um, can you keep on resisting? You know, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the client resistance, right? When does a resistance occur? The resistance occur till the time the person has not experienced the value that he's or she or she's going to get out of that change. So sooner we show an ROI, that is where digital constructs come in, right? It's not about three month engagement anymore. It's about two weeks POC, yeah. right? Smaller the conversation, confine the conversation I mean, in terms of scope. Quicker is the ROI if you can show that and build a confidence that, okay, if you shift from here to here, um, you know, I think the change will become natural. You don't have to convince. It becomes resistance when we try to push things into a, a space without really having justification around it, as a human psychology, right? So if you look at, from that construct, if I look at it, I think it's a value sh you know, prediction. If you can show the business value quicker in the life cycle, easy would it be for you to manage the change, and easy would it be for you to win the client on your side and be client partner. 
you guys want to add this? I yeah. think it's a very important point. Very excellent point. In fact, uh, there is a very popular McKinsey research on change. And uh, I don't remember the statistics. Roughly, it, what I remember is that uh, more than 50% of digital programs fail, not because of we have used a wrong technology. Correct. It's because the change has not been anticipated or managed well. Yeah. So change is very, very key to the success of any digital program. Now, Ashish rightly mentioned, I, my thought is quite aligned with what he said. I remember about a few years back, Eliyahu Goldrath, when he was speaking in Mumbai, uh, he asked the audience, how many of you can come to the stage? Please come, in the next 10 seconds. Nobody got up. He said, I have $1 million. How many of you can come to the stage? All of us got up. No, I think that answers the question, right? If, if the change is value-driven, and it is explicitly showcased, right? If I tell you, 5.30 in the morning, you have to jog 10 times around your uh, apartment. How many of you are determined to jog tomorrow morning? If I say, you do that, you'll get 5,000 rupees. Probably I'm sure the number is much more than what could be otherwise. So change needs to be thought through, and change interventions need to be thought through. It can't be forced. No forced change in the world has succeeded beyond a limit. You will right? only get resistance yeah. if you force the change. That will that'll only, only live, it will be short-lived change for the sake of either uh, fulfilling your boss uh, aspiration or getting a bonus, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want a long-lasting change, you have, to, you have to think through and be creative about it. I'll just caught one example, Ashish. Uh, Please. One of the clients in Sweden uh, where we were talking, we were talking uh, to about uh, fifth, not 50, about 100 to 120 R&D engineers. About 75% of them were PhD holders. And uh, average age could be about 48, 52 in that, that age bracket. We were doing a knowledge management initiative. Naturally, digital-led knowledge management initiative. Naturally, there is a portal where people are encouraged to post okay. their, uh, their uh, knowledge assets. We, we also looked at how to capture the tacit part of the knowledge, which is more intuitive, more soft in nature, et cetera. You can't write it down, right? What are the, what are the ways and means of capturing it, et cetera? We wanted to drive this initiative. We put some email campaigns, and we got the feedback that half of the emails are not even opened. So Sweden, this particular company, again, I don't, I don't want to disclose the company's name. This was in a place called Orebro near uh, Stockholm. So we found something is very culturally interesting. This company, all the research scientists come at around uh, 6.37 in the morning. They leave by around uh, 3.34. Sweden being a Nordic country, you know, the, it gets dark most of, the, most of the time around the year. So people do leave by 4, 4.30. I wish that happens in Bangalore so that we could uh, escape the traffic. <laughs> so around 10-ish, uh, around 10 o'clock, all the engineers, you know, if you, if you come to the corridor at around 10.01, 10.02, you see it's full. Till 9.55, 9.58, it's empty. So 10 sharp, very disciplined folks, uh, 10 sharp, they all come. There is a long coffee table, you know, maybe each table can occupy about 20, around 20 or people across. And there are multiple such tables. And they sit there, pick a uh, cup of coffee, sip the coffee, and stay there for at least 30, 40 minutes. It was routine. And uh, we listened to them. They gossip about the movies. They gossip about all, all, all corporate gossips, right? They crib about their bosses and so on. Now, we thought this 40 minutes is very powerful. Same thing is repeated in the afternoon. We created pamphlets about this knowledge initiative. We spread it on, on the table during this time. And we observed. You know, we, we discreetly observed. So next day, at least 70-80% of pamphlets were picked up. And people were reading it. They themselves became you know, our uh, change agent. They were talking about, oh, I saw this happening. I saw this portal. Very interesting. You can even videograph what you want to speak to and, and uh, record in this uh, knowledge portal, et cetera. And it became a huge success. Now, this was a typical change resistance issue. How we approach this is one of, one, of, one of the interventions that we thought about. So again, the idea came from a business analyst who was there on the ground, 
who sensed this cultural tenets and said that we could convert this as a, as a change, uh, as a change, uh, what do you call it, change driving point or whatever. Correct, correct. So again, as you mentioned, there are multiple ways to handle change, but what you asked is a very, very good question. The, f the, the importance of this question is that there is no good answer to this question. So if I may, I mean, as you rightly Please. said, Venu, uh, one of the things with change, it is not about the business analysts who are struggling with the change, it is the organizations. That's what Venu mentioned. Many of the digital transformation programs are failing because, not because of technology, but the whole concept of what is it that we want to achieve and this whole change management process. And this is again not new, okay? I'll take two examples here, Ashish, with your permission. Um, the first one is, every, I'll take an example of a product organization. So as products are being built, as he said, you know, some uh, ERPs definitely have the luxury of having three years roadmap because the technology is less disruptive relatively. But of course, I mean, that doesn't hold good even for the ERP systems today. Because of the technology changes, the roadmaps have become year on year nowadays. So how do we go and prove to the management that now I would want blockchain introduced Correct. in my payables area? So that's, that in itself is a big uh, you know, challenge. So like what uh, Ashish rightly mentioned, the only way we could do it was doing a POC, a small POC, trying to understand what is the ROI, the benefits, cost benefit analysis. So again, this is an old school thought. What, when you talk about POCs or ROI analysis, it's all something which business analysts in some capacity have done. Correct. But unless we do this, we don't get the budget. And also or contextualize these, these implementations, right? I mean, if yeah. you think about a blockchain implementation where BA is involved in a fintech space, it's pretty easily acceptable. Exactly. Right? People have seen bitcoins and people have seen how things have changed and the application in the payment space. But think about applying blockchain in manufacturing. Exactly. It's and entirely a different space. It's not about the technology success. And adding but to but if, if that has to happen in the manufacturing world, look at the partner ecosystem that needs to change. So it's not about one company that is changing. Ultimately, it's a smart contract, right? The best application of blockchain, in my views, in, in manufacturing, and maybe when you can validate that. That is, again, tapping into unexplored territory. Correct. So think about, so that's what I'm saying. It's, I think it's contextual in nature in which how you operate. And change has to be value driven. As long as you can show value quickly, you can drive the point. So is it advantageous to have a clientele base which is well versed with uh, technologies like blockchain, AI, ML? You can't, you, you can't choose you your can't clients. Control them. <laughs> Would you say, when I, if, I am, if I am a client who doesn't use blockchain technology and if I come to you, hey, um, Arun, can you help me with it? Would you say, no, you are not expert. And, but you won't say that, right? No, it's not so by choice. I'll, I'll take that example. I mean, that's a valid point that you made. What I wanted to ask is, does it make my job simpler or does it make it even more complex? Okay, I'll not, I'll not give you an answer, but I'll give you an example. Every ERP implementation that happens in the industry, okay, it's not now, it's been there for the last three or four decades, comes with lots of resistance and change. Why do I need a system? You know, and those were the days when even people were working on DOS. Why do I need a system? I'm happy with mine. Or they had disparate systems, which they are very well versed with. So this concept of change management is preceded by what even digital transformation talks about, where it says that please ensure that your business processes are re-engineered first, okay? From a business perspective. We do an evaluation first, even before running to choose a technology or a product. The same theme has been followed in the ERP, saying first, try to understand what is the process that you want to achieve before going to the vendors. And coming back to your exact question about the knowledge of the customer, in terms of this technology. Is it easy or difficult? So I'll take the same analogy again. The ERP system is evaluated by the board of directors. Everything is fine. And this is a real life example where I walk into the shop floor in 1999, and then I'm trying to explain, and you know, I'm trying to showcase what, what is coming in these features and so on, this and that. And after five minutes, I realized that the user was not looking at my screen, he was looking at my hand. The reason was they did not know what a mouse was at that point of time. So to answer this, was it easy or difficult? So we had to go and convince them, and partly it was done by the customer himself in terms of their workforce. Of course, it is not the uh, textbook style how they managed this change management, because they were not the educated class. What they said is, we'll give you color monitors. Okay. It, it was like some, you know, some uh, <laughs> you know, goodies to them. Of course, I'm not saying that's the same analogy that we use, 
but definitely it, it makes my life difficult. But we all agree as business analysts, right? What is our primary duty? It is about solving problems. So problems are our opportunities. Correct. So that also helps me enhance my skill. And now maybe what I thought that I knew is not sufficient to convince that person. Either I need to you know, convince myself first, or I need to understand or come up with better uh, either POCs or real life examples of what is happening and try to relate. Yeah. There's no right answer I would give you. Thank you, gentlemen. Any other question? Uh, I work for Capgemini. Uh, I work as a product owner. So I, I just want to start with the opinion and then ask the question. So I would say that uh, the job of the business analyst has become easier over the last decade. It's become super easier over the last decade because I remember when the waterfall model says, you know, after six months I'm going to deliver something and then you write down everything and you test and there are a lot of tools not available as what the young generation today sees. The tools are so nice. Uh, they pro if you're talking about UX, they prototype up front, you know, they have everything, you know, they, they know what is it that they don't have? And the cycle is just, uh, agile sprint is two weeks, and uh, you know your scope, and I think the tools are all there. Only, so thing, is, uh, only thing is missing, or people have to focus is learning even a new technology, new space, everything has become easier, because uh, earlier you have to go for a workshop, learn, hands-on, now even uh, everything is available. It's just that the mindset, to say yes, I want to do it. I think that's. Uh, I love this. <laughs> I love this approach. It's I wish all of us were following this approach. And right. just uh, you know, going to your last point, very valid and pertinent point in terms of learning the technology. Correct. Uh, I, I just have a, dif a difference of opinion. I mean, it, it cannot always uh, not with you, but mm -hmm. the general thought that you know we go and learn, uh, you know, some of the technologies in a classroom session and come back, which is not wrong. But we all know that you know. There's nothing, no substitute to an on-the-job training. And one of the ways in which I have myself learned, and which is nowadays you know, uh, termed as a design thinking workshop, right? So what happens is that's a place where we all know. I mean, the technologists want to understand what is the customer actually asking for. OK, is this the best user interface to build? Is this the right logic, and so on and so forth? And, and that is the place where I've had the opportunity to, to hear from architects you know, where, when all these concepts came in, blockchain, or AI or ML. I, as a business analyst, would learn in that particular design thinking workshop in terms of what is the best fit. So it, it's part of my learning curve. Okay. Maybe that's, that is one of the options which I'm yeah. So I agree. So what's that, your question? Yeah, so my question, right? So my question is like this. Uh, today, I see that BAs are learning, we are doing things, but what do we do in the next five years? Because the, the users, are, today's users, are like, who are like maybe mid who are used to IT systems in the last five, 10 years or 20 years, digital users. But then the real users of the system that we are building today is the youngsters who know things even faster than what we know. Okay. Uh, they're actually the youngsters where their data is exposed to Google, their data is exposed to Amazon. Uh, my uh, car insurance is based on how many items have returned in Amazon in the last six months. The insurance companies are looking at my Amazon shopping policy, shopping trend, to see what should I, how should I price this insurance policy for this person. So if the companies are going there, I think BA should not think about today. They should think about tomorrow. And exactly. how does IABA help people like me to think about tomorrow and say, this is what you see. Because the, my end users are not today's users. My end users are actually tomorrow's users. So this Correct. is my question. So let me answer from an IIBA standpoint how we are addressing this point. I think you raised an absolutely valid point. Um, there are two approaches we have picked up. Mm -hmm. First approach is lifelong learning. Okay. I think, I don't know about other roles because I've been a hardcore business analyst. But in my role, if I look at two and a half decade of my life, I could never stop learning. Okay. Right? And my learning model is not about opening books. I can't read, first of all. I mean, I'm, I hate reading. Okay? okay? But what I do is, use my device at my hand pretty well. And I look at YouTube. Yes. I learned about AI from YouTube, 10 minutes video. I learned about ML, 10 minutes video. I learned about data science, 10 minutes video. And there are so many 10 minutes capsules like that that are available that I can learn it anywhere, even if I'm having a cup of tea. So the learning model has changed even of a person of a 47-year-old. Um, you know, forget. You guys, you're far younger, and the community and the role personas Correct. that you're talking, they are much, much younger than us. Correct. The other point, uh, you, you raised a valid point about personas, mm. right? The generation that we are dealing with now, it's much faster, right? Much quicker to learn, much quicker to deliver, much quicker to 
change their behavior. If they like it, they you know, tell it on Facebook. They don't like it, they you know, blow the trumpet of not liking something in Twitter and you know, Facebook and TikTok and everywhere. Right? So things have changed in the way the Gen, Gen X is communicating uh, uh, with, the, with the world. At IIB level, we are catching up. I think we all are catching up in this room. I don't think we have got a handle around that. I'm sure we all are dealing with this. We deal with mature customers. Yes. As of now, we have dealt with mature consumers of businesses, manufacturing, retail. But things have shifted. Okay. What we are trying to do is look at practices in what can enable that capability for the community. Okay. So if you look at from a thought leadership paper standpoint, right? we clearly pointed out uh, if you look at the digital series, there are two papers. One is a, uh, it talks about best practices, second talks about the competencies, and also give you a definition of three business analysis roles that will evolve in a digital world. There's a role called Renaissance BA, okay. which is very similar to T-shaped BA that we discussed in the morning, mm -hmm. right? And we use that term called T-shaped BA. Why? Because it's not about just business analysis anymore. And if you start contextualizing that conversation in the world that you're living in, if you're dealing with those kind of personas, you need to know how those guys are operating. Correct. So stakeholder analysis becomes foundational, but it's a very different kind of stakeholder. Right? So understanding and empathizing with them becomes even more critical before you design anything, any solution or solve any problem for them. So we started to take that approach. Uh, and you see that symptom in some of the collateral that we are releasing on a daily basis. OK. So um, adding to that, Ashish, uh, basically, I mean, uh, when we spoke about uh, T-shaped skills, right? Nowadays, we are also talking about box-shaped and circle-shaped skills. Yeah. So we know that there is still scope for improvement. Correct. So that is one of the things. And the second thing, a very pertinent point that you have brought in about the business analyst. The users that you are facing are not only uh, I mean, are working on Amazon or other sites, they also do their research. I mean, I'm talking about any such user. Yes, they do their research even before talking to us. Correct. Sometimes their knowledge level is pretty high. Mm -hmm. And like Ashish rightly pointed out, the concept of personas has been evolving in the industry. Correct. So when I talk from a product, a B2B product as well, the traditional personas were, you know, how would, what would a CEO do, expect from the system? What is a you know, payables manager going to look at it? What is an employee expecting from the system and so on? But what has added to this layer of uh, all these function rich is the horizontal layer, which is across, which talks about the usability, the intuitiveness, and how would a novice user react to it? And one of the things that has been implemented recently in uh, our organization is, while all the standard system testing, regression testing, all of these happen, this is we have a concept of exploratory testing. Mm -hmm. We just give it to folks who have not used this product, or you never have seen these screens. We ask them to go and play with it. So this has become imperative definitely for the organizations as well, which means we as business analysts also need to ensure that we cater to. A lot of gaming companies have started following this trend. Right? We're, yeah. we're giving games to kids mm -hmm. for them to test it. Right? And I think it's yeah. just giving and them complete insight. And our roadmap is not confined. I mean, ERPs don't compare with ERPs anymore. Correct. They, sky's the limit. You are forced to compare with all the Googles and Amazons. Correct. That's the experience. That's the experience, the experience part. part. Exactly. Exactly. There was a customer. You had you had a question, Garima. No, you do absolutely. She's a volunteer, by the way, from a college. She's not a business analyst. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm not a BA yet. I'm just an MBA from Christ University. So I was just wondering, with all these talks so BA, about BA is already there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Asking the question. Yes. So I was wondering, uh, along the track of digital technologies, AI, deep learning, and machine learning, I was wondering how how much longer till a business analyst role gets automated, or is it even possible? With the advent oh, of deep enough. learning in AI, um, can the machines do a better job than us in uh, analyzing uh, the role of business and you know, yeah, replacing possibly a BA? Point. Yeah, point. See, you are a BA already. Exactly. And to me, the answer is yes. Right? How many of us believe in this room that now machines can do coding? Raise your hand. All of us, right? How many of us believe that in any engagement that we have delivered in the past, 60 to 70 percent of the requirements have remained pretty similar in nature for any system that you're building? You're building security, you're building personas, you're building transactional systems. There are few at least, right? So as we, I think in my views, for sure, you know, we could build 
um, we could build systems, and fortunately, I was part of an IP development in my previous organization where we actually built the system to predict defects. Um, you know, in, in our in our uh, whole uh, model, scientific model that we had created using some of these technologies. So to me, the answer is yes. Yeah, I, adding to that, I mean, I don't want to take the name of the organization. So you may be aware of this concept of RS, RFP, right? Where we respond yes. Uh, yes. to the proposals and so on. That has actually been automated in many of the organizations. Okay. Of course, I mean, I, it is at a maturing, I mean, in some cases, it is at a maturing stage where you still need an intervention. and. Like what he, what he said, right? I mean, there are companies exploring this aspect as Got well. It. We want to go into more value-added functions. It's not like we want to do away with the role of a PA. We still need product ownership, product management, change management. There's so many other roles, so many value additions that we want to bring in. Like in the previous uh, presentation, where uh, you know it was rightly put that there are two sets of BAs. One who would want to work on how do I automate this process, and another set of BAs, how could we bring change? Or how could we bring a change in the thought process? But the second one will definitely start prevailing even in our uh, community as well. And at least in the transition phase, there are areas where we are definitely required to intervene. I'm sure uh, people who have been exposed to AI know about the concept of bias and so on. So I, I'll just take one example. Um, this is like the old school recruitment process 15 years back when I said, okay, I need a CA profile and I get a bunch of MCA profiles, you know, the, uh, the BA versus MBA. <laughs> And then uh, I talk to the recruiter and understand, well, I asked for CA, why did you give me MCA, sir? I give you masters in CA, right? I've given you a better profile. <laughs> okay? So, having said this, what is AI? You know, it tries to learn based on the data that we serve, okay? And we have seen cases in Amazon, what happened, you know? Uh, the uh, gender bias that has happened, and so on and so forth. So there is still, at this point of time, we need to intervene to make the systems more and more intelligent while we move to a value addition you know, or an value added role. And there are it's, companies who are already yeah. trying the model that you're saying where they're trying to put AI-based bots yes. Yes. to converse with the customers and the stakeholders and interpret requirements. Of course, that still has limitations. So uh, it's I mean, evolving. Uh, yeah, especially in the B2B. Again, uh, um, so there are lots of use cases which is coming up, especially on the human resource management side where bots are replacing lots of help desks. Whether it's HR related queries or other queries, and what is also being explored, again going back to this question, technologies are changing. We are talking about user experience. User experience is not just about user interface, it's a mental map. The way in which I do the different steps to achieve something. But the way the technology is now going in, do I really need a UI to operate? That's, that's the stage at which even B2B is. You know, there, is, there, is there are things which are being experimented like conversational UI. So the BAs, some of the BAs who were previously working on designing uh, the screens or uh, you know the functionality for moving from one screen to the other you know when and they move to sort of a guided approach are now experimenting with the conversational UI. Yes. So did you get your question? Yeah. I mean the answer. So <laughs> from my perspective, I have stay. to make a career choice after my MBA. Yeah, so, so would it still be a good idea for me to become a BA? I'll help you. Can I'll me. give a simpler simpler <laughs> answer. I don't know whether both of them confused you. If the question is about is there a relevance for a BA role yes. for the next 20 years? Yes. Answer is very simple. Answer is yes. 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 No A can take over a BA's role. Yes. Right. Some part of it could be done for your benefit. Yes. Like how a doctor uses clinical di diagnostics versus an MRI scan. Yes. That is, that is, that'll come in your, uh, your good, right? It'll come right. in your... Yes. HI is benefit. still superior to AI, right? Yes. Human intelligence. All right, so we'll close Thank here. I'm sorry, again, I'm acting... Yes. Uh, yes. I saw a hand there. <laughs> <laughs> So last question. Normally back rows are favorites of mine. <laughs> so the last question, guys, let's keep it short. School teacher. Not, 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 not to misinterpret the statement. <laughs> you, could, you could shout, we can hear, go ahead. So it's not about best fit. Let me answer this question. It's not about best fit. It's about the agility that boardroom needs to stay up the curve in the competitive market. You can't build strategy in six months and then execute for the next three years. Those days are gone. 
You're talking about strategy which will live for next two weeks, three weeks, maybe three months, and you have initiatives that will deliver you, show you results within two weeks, three weeks POCs. So that's the agility context that we are talking. We're not talking about software development, scrum, getting into boardroom. The point is how you think about developing a strategy is not a three year period anymore. It's about three months period. How you think about initiative is to breaking down those three months strategies that you build into maybe five, two months initiatives and getting it done quickly to see what kind of results are we getting. Does it make sense for us to proceed like that? Right? So, and a lot of organizations have started to adopt this model in the telecom world, in the retail world. It's the competitive advantage, right? I mean, if you do it earlier than your competition, you get 10% market share, as simple as that. So it makes sense for companies to go that route, and I'm sure all of Absolutely. us have experienced that. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, I'll answer in two dimensions. If you're building uh, a steel plant, normally it takes about five years to construct a steel plant. Uh, think about agility there, right? I have to build a steel plant over the next five years with a clear plan versus a company like Volvo in Sweden, for example. They are trying to build in a remote diagnostics of the car so that a car doesn't need to come to the workshop for uh, services, right? The car would speak to you as the owner. If you are the driver, car would speak to you. And they are even thinking beyond. Without you knowing, the car can communicate with a server saying that I'm not doing well. Please help me, right? Without you knowing, when you go to sleep at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., the car will get serviced. When you get up at 6 a.m. and start the car, car is repaired. That's the aspiration. When you drive a transformation of that kind of a nature, you may not have the comfort of a time-tested steel plant construction, Correct. which you have a clear visibility for the next five years. Great so example. is agile strategy, it depends, right? If you're, if you're a CEO of a steel plant, what is agility for you? You know, you may want to think about. But if you are the Volvo CEO who is constructing a different capability, then agility has got a different meaning. So with this, I think uh, we'll close the conversation. I know if we continue to uh, on, on this track, we can stay in the e till the evening. But uh, thank you, guys. We know uh, we had few speakers who had to drop out uh, because of certain reason. But it's a very phenomenal construct. Yeah, today morning, we, we thought we might even maybe cancel this and put it off to with a reshape tomorrow but glad that we yeah. took up and thanks to you Ashish I think thank you I think those you took the courage in terms of how we do it together <laughs> really appreciate it.